What is excellence? Uh, we could actually turn to philosophy. Plato has opined about it. We could go east. Uh, Confucius certainly wrote about it. Uh, in India, the Bhagavad Gita talks about it. We can define excellence in terms of outcomes. You beat competitors, you outdo a benchmark, uh, you consistently uh, exhibit uh, some measure of financial performance, and they're all wonderfully relevant things. I'm a social scientist, however, and what I'm curious about is exactly what underlies your ability to beat a benchmark, what underlies your ability to do consistently well over a long period of time. My co-conspirator Bob Sutton and I have spent seven years um, looking at the question of excellence. And for us, a good working definition is we know that an organization is excellent when people do the right thing, even when nobody is watching over their shoulder. That's what excellence is. Because if you need people to watch you, if you need people to monitor you, you can't scale. Uh, for every 30 people, you need three bosses to monitor them. You do the math, you can imagine how hard it is to actually scale up uh, excellence. The problem of excellence is it's always in short supply. You have excellence in one pocket or another. Spreading it means voltage loss. The other thing is, as your organizations grow bigger and larger, sadly, the smart people inside them become dumber. Uh, I don't mean the smart people inside them become stupid. They actually become silent, and silence is the enemy of excellence. So let me give you the core sort of message. The core message is it's all about the mindset and not the footprint. It's very easy to lose sight of it. If you picked up this morning's New York Times, the, a company called Health Management Associates was indicted for pursuing a footprint. What was that? Admitting patients, lots of them, even if they actually didn't need hospital care. A baby whose temperature was 98.7 was diagnosed with a fever and promptly admitted. How did they do that? They had a scorecard. Green meant you were a doctor doing your job. Yellow, you were close to the admission quota. Red, you were a laggard. What was the result? They got a footprint. They forgot the patient. They forgot uh, what uh, integrity was all about. They ran into difficulty. So you have to always be careful about the footprint, not overcoming and superseding the mindset. What's a mindset? When you strip down to it for me, as a social scientist at the most behavioral level, it simply becomes verbs and adverbs, not nouns. Nouns are abstract. If I tell you ingenuity, you'll have to take 25 seconds to figure that out. What does that mean? But as at Facebook, where they're growing so rapidly, what's the mindset there? Be bold, be quick, make an impact. Look at the language. Look at the emphasis on action. And what do they do? When they put you through boot camp, they give you an individual problem that you have to solve. It's a problem about user experience so that you can call your mom, dad, boyfriend, girlfriend, and say, hey, see that thing about Facebook that you hated? I fixed it. So I asked the head of engineering, what happens if you don't fix it in 72 hours? What do you think he told me? He looked at me and he said, Huggy, we fire him. I said, but you just hired them. And they said, we can't afford to have people sit on the bench. At the end of boot camp, do you think anybody is confused about what being bold is, about what making an impact is, and what being quick is? So the most important thing about scaling is it's all propelled by the feeling of felt accountability. Not just the fact that I own the place, but the place owns me. Let me take you back to India, uh, the Taj Hotel, where there was a terrorist attack. Hotel staff aren't trained to cope with terrorist attacks. If there is a terrorist attack, what do you expect the hotel staff to do? To head for the exit. That day, nobody had headed for the exit. Cooks escorted people out. Cooks actually threw themselves in the line of fire. Uh, people who were concierges helped people out. There was no command and control. The general manager's family was being extinguished alive 35 floors up, yet people did their job. Later, when people asked them, you were amazing, you were heroic, their response was, 
we were just being ourselves, our, and we were just doing our job. Our job wasn't to be an ambassador of the Taj to the customer. Our job was to be an advocate of the customer. When I was actually talking about this to a group of senior executives at Stanford, one of them actually made an excellent point. He said, but that's an extreme example of crises. The real test of excellence is what happens every day. And I was about to tell him something, and then one of the senior executives in the classroom quickly put his hand up and said, let me tell you my example. I went with my wife and three-year-old kid to Mumbai, India. A car from the Taj met us. We were jet lagged, our baby was hungry, we were agonizing about how long the check-in process would take. We go in, there's a person who meets us at the lobby and tells us, you don't need to check in, go to your room, your bags will be sent to you. And they're escorted by a person from the Taj Hotel, they open the door and lo and behold, in the room, there's actually a thermos of hot milk and cookies for the three-year-old. And this guy looks at the Taj person and says, how did you know? And he tells them, when you got on the car and the baby started crying, the driver called the front office and said, baby on board, baby jet lagged, baby hungry. <laughs> Think about that. That's what excellence is. The best part of the story is he wasn't even an employee. He was a contractor. Now, three key lessons for us. The first thing, scaling up excellence is not an air war only, but a ground war. As my colleague Jim March says, it's not just poetry, but plumbing too. Let me give you an example of a person, a couple rather, of whom we're writing a case study. Uh, Shannon May and her husband Jay, they're in Kenya. They have the modest and poetic goal of changing the lives of 10 million school kids in Kenya and Africa. She's created 400 plus schools. People in her schools outperform competing schools by 200% on every conceivable yardstick. It's a venture capital funded enterprise. You have to pay five bucks a child per month. It's amazing. Look at the way they fought the ground war. I said, how many people are there to run the school? She said, one. I said, how do I pay tuition? She said, mobile, bank, mobile transfer through your phone. I said, why? She said, if you do it through cash, it's a recipe for corruption. I said, don't you need a person to buy books? No, done by central office. Where are you going to find the teachers? She said, they don't need to be teachers beforehand to teach them. We, in fact, don't want them to be teachers. How do they teach if they don't know how to teach? Well, we've actually redone a version of a Nook-like thing where you click it, it says 354. We know everybody in eighth grade across all our 300 schools, they know exactly what to teach. As a teacher, you don't need to be a content provider. You can be a content disseminator. You always have to think of the ground war. The second important lesson we've learned is D Michael Deering, a wonderful venture capitalist in the Bay Area, always, uh, he's also known as the, uh, you know, whisperer to early startups, I might add, along the lines of the horse whisperer. Uh, he actually asks people, do you want to be a Catholic or do you want to be a Buddhist? It appealed to me very much because I went to Jesuit school in India. What he means by being Catholic is you actually have a recipe, a model, you replicate. in and out Burger is a phenomenal example of that. Uh, tight model, replication. The other extreme, you could be a Buddhist. A brilliant example of a Buddhist and a practicing one at that is Chip Conley. Chip Conley had a string of hotels called Joie de Vivre, 36 hotels that he sold. Um, they range in price, 150 bucks, 700 bucks. I said, how do you do this? He said, I'm a Buddhist. I outline principles. I said, what are they? He says, every time my managers come to me for money, I ask them these four questions. Question one, which magazine do people who come to your hotel read? If it's the New Yorker, I know exactly who they are. If it's the Rolling Stone, I know exactly who they are. Second, what are the five adjectives you use to describe the hotel? So if you say sophisticated, for example, the next question he would ask is, how does the consumer know that through the five senses? So if I walk in, one look at the bar, I need to know this is a sophisticated place. What about employees? Same question. How would they know this adjective through their five senses? Buddhist and Catholic, or you can be in between and you can actually have guardrails as it were. 
So uh, guardrails that allow you to navigate what you're doing. The Institute for Health Improvement did that brilliantly when they actually scaled six innovations across hospitals. But they told hospitals, you mix and match. And what did they do? Their campaign allowed more than 100,000 lives to be saved in the United States within a two-year period in American hospitals. And these are lives that actually would have been lost through preventable medical errors otherwise. The last lesson I'd like to close with is the journey about scaling excellence is invariably a journey from bad to great. When you have bad, good doesn't survive. One of the most elementary findings in psychology is bad is way stronger than good. If I ask you, what are the most powerful memories you have? Bad memories surge to the forefront. What are the most important relationships you have? Bad relationships surge to the forefront. Indeed, a study of married couples has revealed that for every bad thing you say to your partner or spouse, you need a minimum of five things, good things to counterbalance it. Ponder that ratio. Uh, <laughs> so you really have to start with the bad. And starting with the bad implies bad in an organization means nobody cares. That's what it is a signal of. They did a brilliant experiment at, uh, in the Netherlands. They randomly put envelopes that were addressed to people uh, with uh, a currency note that was visible. Some of the mailboxes were dirty, some of the mailboxes were clean. Guess which actually had a higher return rate? Four to one difference. Clean mailbox, those envelopes were four times as likely to be returned. Dirty mailbox, what did people do? As soon as they saw their curren the currency note inside it, they quickly pocketed it themselves. So, the closing part I want to um, end on is a lot of bad actually has to do with cognitive load. We increase bad things for people by increasing load on them. What do we mean by load? The most famous article in psychology says we can remember seven things. If you have more than seven, your feeling of accountability is degraded. Beautiful study at the Princeton Theological Seminary. A group like you divided into two conditions. You were told to give a lecture for three minutes on the parable of the Good Samaritan. The only, and you were told the only thing is you couldn't give it here. You had to actually go to a building yonder 300 yards away to give the talk. En route, the experimenters had a student who was their accomplice lying on the floor moaning and groaning. One group, one set of participants was told, we'll give you 10 minutes, but they were hurried. The other group wasn't actually hurried. And they were observing how many people would actually walk by this accomplice who was lying on the ground saying, help me, I need help. Amazing. The group that was urged to hurry, they were saying, I have to give a talk on the parable of the Good Samaritan. I have to help people. They're walking and there's this guy saying, Help me, help me. They walked right by that guy. <laughs> they walked right by that guy. That is actually what cognitive load can do. What is it all of you can do? You can scale excellence. And you can scale excellence by doing the simplest of things. Remember, we don't have two senses only. Uh, the sense of sight and the sense of hearing, we have five senses. I was recently talking to a person who heads a big retail chain. How did you turn around your store so brilliantly? You didn't have the money to hire people. You didn't have the money to pay them incentives. You didn't have the money to do anything. Tell me, what did you do? And he looked at me and he said, Huggy, I asked them to do two things. When customers walked into the store, I asked them to greet the customers with a smile. And the second, and really the most important thing I told them to do is, every time customers walk in, give them a basket. What happens when people buy a ba get a basket? How many things will you buy? One or seven? That was the one thing they did and they were able to change the organization and scale excellence. So think of scaling excellence in your own organizations, in your own lives, and in your own work units. Thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you.